Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I feel pretty excited. I feel like I get to chair the most good-looking panel on the stage today. <laughs> so, ladies, let's get things started. I believe this is one of the most exciting and prolific industries that we get to work and play in. Now, we have heard Vision 2030 a long time ago, and we have been packing and unpacking and repacking this conversation for a while. I'd like to personalize this by asking each of you, what does Vision 2030 mean to you? I'll start with you, Aradna. Right, um, morning all. Uh, so I can answer this many ways. Um, first off, from a helicopter, 30,000 view down, outside in. Vision 2030 for me is at the pinnacle of human ambition and intentionality where you take one of the least visited countries in the world and then overlay it with a layer of ambition and say we're going to make it the most visited destination in the world and target 100 million visitors. And then you go on to achieve it step by step. So to me, it's a perfect example of how you make hope real and visible. Now, as a global travel and tourism expert, for me, Vision 2030 is, it's a lot more than tourism projects, which is diversifying the economy. To me, I think it is a perfect opportunity to showcase how you can use tourism as an agent of change and as a catalyst to really solve some of the biggest problems facing humanity. And finally, as an individual, as a woman, I think Vision 2030 is a path to show how every boy and every girl can have equal rights, equal opportunities, equal access, and the promise of the same bright future. You see, you have to understand what the Vision 2030 is doing is really challenging the perception of, well, national and international perception of what Saudi Arabia can do, how far social transformation can be pushed. Um, and they're doing it, I think, in a remarkable manner. So if you look at the population, 70% of the population is below the age of 35. And there was a recent survey which said 93% of young Saudis <laughs> believe the country is going in the right direction. There can be no better testament to the fact that it's actually being a success. I agree. Hala, what about you? What does Vision 2030 mean for you? I mean, clearly there was a lot of passion. Always. And, uh, and, uh, I'm with you 100%. I probably look at it slightly differently. Definitely very excited. But perhaps I have also been blessed to be working in KSA since 2005. So I just want to reflect for a moment on all these journeys and all these developments with the private sector. The potential is unbelievable. And for Vision 2030, to, I mean, what happened it was a decision supported by a vision. You know, from the point of view of the offering, what can you capitalize? The biggest transformation that I'm super excited about, although I'm the financial advisor who is boring and doing the real estate, what I'm sensing is the transformation in the attitude, in the mindset, which is extremely important for the success of this vision. And I can speak to that, having traveled 18 years in a row, how this has changed, how the opportunity now is being unlocked, and it's just very exciting. I think somehow we'd have to just be careful that Vision 2030 is not just focused on one. We're talking about hospitality today, but it is how the different verticals are working together to support the success. And I feel a bit of an obligation to say, you know, having initially started in Europe and then Asia, arrived in Dubai in 2007, the learning is there's going to be big plans. We need to move fast, massive gains. But I just always want to say, let's be careful. There are some pains around the way, and we need to acknowledge them as much as we're passionate and excited, just to avoid and ensure that you know, there is sustainability in these long-term visions. Agreed, and we're going to get to those pains. Diane, how do you plan on harnessing your expertise to not only contribute but lead innovation in Vision 2030? Well, I think what we love about the 2030 vision is that it focuses on three key pillars, which essentially is to create a thriving society, uh, to look at uh, how that intersects with creating a thriving economy, 
and then actually looking at the most ambitious innovation which we're here to discuss at this conference. And how that plays into us as architects and designers is to actually craft and create the most unbelievable experiences for uh, the hospitality industry and do it, as, as you mentioned, in the most sustainable way. So how can we as architects and designers partner with the developers and the owners within the hospitality industry to really design and craft the kinds of spaces that are going to provide the stepping stones to uh, create that economy that is going to be sustainable. There's an extraordinary opportunity for all of us to focus on uh, creating something that the world has not seen before. And I'm not talking about, you know, we heard the previous panel talking about AI and all of these exciting innovations, but it's actually about creating something that is sustainable, that's crafted in the roots of that amazing culture that exists in, in Saudi. So I look forward to actually seeing how it develops, but a great, uh, a, a great vision. Now, Radna, we heard Hala mention her experience in KSA then and now. It's no secret that the UAE and KSA's growth has been unprecedented. Can you tell us your experience how do you see the progression in KSA versus then and now in terms of mindset, culture, even hospitality opportunities? Uh, look, there's been a sea change, and I agree with Hala. Uh, if you go back 10, 15 years, there's been a sea change. And let me start from a broader economy perspective, specific to women as well, right? So just five years ago, the percentage of participation of women in the workforce was 17%. Today, it's at 37%, and that's happening at the same time when the unemployment rates are falling, and we have 2.2 million Saudis working in the private sector, which is the highest ever in history. So from a change perspective, not only is it enormously encouraging, I think it's unprecedented. Now, with regards to tourism, I think it's also interesting because tourism is one of those sectors which is completely transversal, so it's affected and it affects so many other sectors, manufacturing, construction, agriculture, mining, um, uh, fishery, you don't think about it, but it does. And the impact of tourism, it, tourism has an outsized impact on women specifically, so tourism employs 53% women compared to uh, the wider economy, which is only at 39%. So the impact of tourism on women is that much higher. Now, if you have a lot more women in the workforce, what's happening? We're seeing their incomes rise. We're seeing a proportionate increase in dual income households. And where do women spend when they are the decision makers? They spend on technology, they spend on healthcare, education, travel, tourism, leisure. So again, great for the industry, and we're seeing all of these change. Finally, about the mindset and culture, I think it's important to mention, this is really, I think, interesting what I'm seeing. So there was traditionally, and it still exists, there was a traditional mindset of command and control kind of leadership. And we're seeing that it's actually not yielding the same kind of returns that it historically has. And we are now having a demand from the younger generation to have leaders who are more empathetic, authentic, you know, who actually are happy to say they don't have all the answers and are humble and willing to show their vulnerability. So the old notion of this machoism or bravado or Jupiterian ambition and alpha style leadership, I think is being slowly replaced by a more calm and rational leadership. And I think that's also very good news for women because we are naturally better at leading in a more inclusive way. Diane, how do you think the role of women has evolved in the region, specifically in the hospitality space? Well, I'm, I'm actually just going to refer uh, quickly to, to Gensler as a, as a business because we have a co-CEO uh, leadership um, format within Gensler, which is extremely successful because you have this uh, complementary viewpoint of male and female actually partnering together to create a business, a thriving business, which is actually focused on bringing people along and being very inclusive. 
And I see that change happening within the mindset, both in the UAE and within Saudi, of this more inclusive partnering with men actually partnering with females to mentor and guide and bring them up into the leadership position. And I think that actually is going to result in extraordinary opportunities all the way through, um, both from the younger generation and uh, females coming into leadership roles because they have an approach as females of being more bonding and family orientated. So creating family organizations or the, the feeling of a family within an organization, which just allows businesses to thrive. Thank you, Diane. Hala, I want to get your perspective on something. It is safe to say that times are changing. We in this region are no lo longer looking to outside to inform our decisions, to you know, set trends. We are rewriting history. We are creating our own culture, laying our own landscape. The UAE has been on the radar for a while, but KSA is coming. And this is a great opportunity for KSA to compete with popular destinations, if you will. Can you share your perspective on the hospitality opportunities for KSA from that regard? Sure. I think if we just look, uh, I mean, over the last 10 years, in terms of international arrivals into this region, when we compare to the rest of the continents, it's somewhere around 7 to 9 percent, which suggests there is huge potential. Uh, it's fair to assume that Dubai has very well developed, the UAE in particular, some other markets, but we definitely can benefit from the entire region developing. So the addition of KSA from a tourism perspective is only going to help further strengthen, right? So that's on a very macro level. I think more specifically, what Dubai has been successful in doing, not alone developing the market and becoming a mature and solid market, but really positioning the region as we have a new offering, we have a newer offering, perhaps the benefit of KSA in particular as well, although I would want to stress that there is so many different dynamics between comparing Dubai to KSA, we need to be careful. If I could just quickly add, when we're talking about employment and women, one of the key differences is the population size, right? So KSA, you have a large pool of talent that have been ready for 20 years. They just wanted the decision to actually say, you can do it. And that is really one of the pluses when you look at the labor market in KSA versus the UAE. But going back to looking at the hospitality opportunity. I think one of the advantages KSA has is a learning, right? They're hiring experts that have worked in this region, specifically in Dubai. The learning curve is quicker. They have the funds. So the government is stepping in to pave the way and inviting the private to support, which is a great combination for future opportunities. And more importantly, for those that know KSA, there is no one market. I mean, if Dubai, Dubai today has, believe it or not, 12 sub-markets in terms of how we look at hotel positioning, average rate, target segments, just what Saudi has all across from your religious tourism to your cultural and heritage to doing business in the capital. And more importantly is domestic tourism. I look at KSA more in comparison, for instance, to places like Egypt, to Morocco perhaps, where you have enough of a domestic tourism that has been traveling out and potentially now will support your growth. Uh, so diversifying that offering, but again, to the point of sustainability, I'm, I'm just careful as an advisor in eventually making sure we're div diversifying enough and not cannibalizing. Right? I mean, along that vision, some of those projects will materialize and will definitely allow KSA to, be, to become even more on the map than it is currently. Radna, I want to get your perspective. Mega projects like the Red Sea project, they are giving tourists an opportunity to come to this region and have a very unique, distinct, but high-end experience. 
share your opinion on how KSA is going to be projecting some of the most incredible hospitality opportunities out there and be a real competitor for even islands or other popular destinations. I'm going to pick up on uh, what um, Hala finished her sentence with, to put KSA on the map. Uh, and I think we have to be cautious. You don't want to be just on the map. You want to be on the map for the right reasons. Um, and I'm probably going to be, um, and I'll come to the Red Sea project, but I, I just, I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. Because um, historically, one of the big problems with tourism when it comes to innovation and change has been that we will come up with a very clever adjective and we'll pop it in front of the word tourism, which is a noun, and then we say, oh, it's the now cool buzzword and the new, uh, new kid on the block, the new thing that's happening, right? Think about it. Rural tourism, cultural tourism, sustainable tourism, uh, transformational tourism, um, over tourism, right? So we've seen this and we've been on this loop for a very, very long time. In light of that, and I want to come to the Red Sea Global and what they're doing, I think, and I'm not without bias, you know that because I chair the advisory board, but I have to say from my point of view, what they're doing is three things. Number one, they're ripping out the rule book and really challenging the status quo. Number two, they're really elevating the conversation with radical thinking, which is making us shift our mindsets. And number three, I think it's moving from a more passive to a more active role where you're moving away from sustainability into regeneration and talking and thinking about how can you add back to the environment? How can you give back more to the locals, to the, to the communities? So this active reinvention like this is something we've not seen in the world before where you're constantly thinking how are you going to decarbonize the world how are you going to improve working conditions how are you going to make things equal and make the world a little bit of a better place and they're doing all of this simply very simply by focusing on people and the planet and i genuinely believe the most successful companies of the future will be those that are not contributing or creating problems in the world in the first place, but are actually playing a very active role in solving those problems for humanity. And I think Red Sea is doing exactly that. Thank you. Diane, so when we talk about the future, it's both limitless, but it's also limiting. And it comes with a whole bag of unknowns. What do you think are some of the sets of unknowns that we either haven't spoken about or haven't spoken enough about as we gear towards the future? Well, I want to just tack on to what, what you were saying, Aradna, about um, the sustainability, because I think this is really driving innovation and our approach to actually what tourists are really looking for. And, and this is really a, a gap for us, I feel. Um, we have a research institute who really looks very closely at what guests are looking for. And uh, they've recognized, or we've recognized, that actually guests want to participate and become part of a great purpose. And when you actually have that as a driver, you find that that is really an extraordinary opening for people to become part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And that gives us the opportunity to actually participate and create the most innovative, uh, we spoke about experiential. And uh, when guests actually feel like they can come participate in growing a coral reef or uh, protecting baby sea turtles and understanding the kinds of sensitivities around what they can create and craft, um, the previous panel spoke about memorable experiences and that's what hospitality is all about. How do we actually create those one-of-a-kind, extraordinary experiences, giving back to the planet that feeds into the economy, that creates something that is just a, a one-of-a-kind. Um, and I think that's, that's the gap. Hala? Can I just add on this one? Because I'm clearly all for sustainability and innovation in our space. I think it's important, and I definitely agree with regards to our responsibility. Right, as we, uh, you know, towards other citizens, towards the world. My concern with some of these projects is that we are not necessarily considering the financial sustainability. 
Now, because I sit in the seat of the financial advisor who needs to make sure that the numbers look good, there is a solid return, and despite the volatility of the market, you will not bleed, right? What we're finding is at times there's a conflict between that sustainability and the financial sustainability of these projects. And when I say financial sustainability, oftentimes the decisions are being based on the now and not 10 years from now. And we've seen that example, and I'm not talking about KSA, it will play out, but I, I'm comfortable to actually bring in the Dubai experience or what I've experienced myself in China or elsewhere. If projects are not financially sustainable, I mean, clearly they have to be viable, but sustainable in the sense also how flexible they are during the difficult times that we can turn them around. We've seen a couple of developments, for instance, in Dubai that failed, but the ability to turn them around rather quickly is impressive. So I'd like to always try to understand how much of these sustainable, innovative initiatives impact the financial sustainability of the project. Hello. And I'm very excited as a, user, as a guest, don't get me wrong. I mean, I would love <laughs> to be and experience this, but I'm just concerned around the costs that go into the investment. Hala, I want to stay with you as the hardcore numbers queen on this panel right now. We already know that there's so much appetite, so much investment for Vision 2030. What do you think we can look forward to in terms of returns? The returns, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question, especially when you're looking at standalone corporate hotel versus a mixed-use scheme. Right, I'll answer you, but I think, A, we need to recognize that there are two different investments that are being made. There are those investments that we don't expect returns. And when I say we is more the government, is not necessarily looking for returns. They are looking to create a destination, to employ people, and to really do support the sector. Uh, and, and there is a list of those. Right, so when I look at the feasibility studies of those projects, there is no way ever they're gonna make sufficient money or any healthy returns. But with those projects where either it's private or it's a collaboration, but returns are at the heart of the way they're approaching that. So from value engineering, from the design standpoint, from bringing in a consultant to actually assist with the development scheme, the sustainability gap opportunity, we are still looking at relatively healthy returns. Single assets, perhaps, I know it's not going to be very exciting, but double digits is long gone in the hospitality industry. But, so you're looking at around 8 to 9%. But what we've also learned, and I think this is what this conference and the transformation in the industry is not to look at hotel developments as per se. So we're not just looking at creating more rooms. We're looking to create experiences, and this is what was said earlier on. When you're creating an experience, you're less dependent on that income stream from the room, and you're just diversified, well diversified. You're well diversified with bringing in your branded residents, bringing in recreation, entertainment, F&B, and that's where you can realize double-digit returns on those investments. Exciting times ahead. Aradna. I've heard you speak passionately about sustainability, and not just in neutralizing tourism effect on the environment, but also giving back to it. As we move towards Vision 2030, how do we ensure that regenerative tourism is on the front lines of hospitality? As Hala was speaking, I was itching to, uh, <laughs> itching to speak, so I'm happy that this has come to me. Listen, I have a problem with the word sustainability, and it's, I know my per personal problem, but by definition, when you use the word sustainability, it 
it is defeatist because you're coming at it from a point of damage control. Let's try and leave the situation as less bad as possible. And what we really need to do is make the transition from less bad to more good. And I always give this example, when you're sending your kids off to school, do you tell them, go be less bad today? Right? No, right? I hope not. You tell them, go be good today. Learn something if you can. Um, so I think what we need to do is really make the transition from less bad to more good. I'll give you another one. This is a worse off. If someone asks you, how's your marriage? And you say, it's sustainable. I mean, that's not very good. It's not going to do that far. Livable, exactly. <laughs> so we want to make the transition from sustainable to regenerative, because regenerative by definition is higher ambition, and higher ambition fosters hope. And in the times that we live in today, if anything, all of us, what we need is to not temper our hope with realism. I mean, if you put a risk person on the panel, that's, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen. But I think we need to temper our realism with hope, if that makes sense. I hope nobody's marriage in this room is sustainable um, <laughs> after this panel. So let's, let's get to the heart of why we are all sitting on this stage, the role that women play in hospitality. Women have a very important role in KSA and the UAE's Vision 2030 plans. I would like to ask you, Diane, I'll start with you. How has leadership roles within hospitality transformed from where you've been sitting over the last years? Well, it's interesting. I was actually uh, chatting with a colleague before coming into uh, to the hall earlier today, and we were saying it's really interesting because when we present to uh, design panels, developers, clients within our region, within Dubai, we find ourselves actually presenting to decision makers who are ma mainly female. They sit on the panels and they are very uh, well qualified as architects, engineers, etc., making those decisions, which is really phenomenal to see. And they are very tough uh, to deal with, which is really fabulous. Um, in Saudi, not as much. Um, and I think that there's a, an enormous opportunity for females in leadership roles within, within Saudi to be taking the place there uh, to come into those decision-making uh, positions to actually guide the development, because we are all, I believe, on this panel uh, really interested in making sure that we create regenerative designs. And I think, uh, naturally, we take on the uh, EQ role of creating what, how we can look after our planet. And I think that role that females play is really key and fundamental in creating our future. So I think that role is being taken more by females um, to make sure that actually our um, embodied carbon and operating carbon within the developments that we're creating are actually making a difference. So I look forward to seeing more leaders in Saudi. As to Ayahala, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, I don't want to take us back as a species, but you specifically work in a, what would be considered a very male-dominated numbers sort of industry. What do you think we can do to encourage more women to get into hospitality space in UAE, in KSA? I'll start off by saying that, I mean, genuinely, for me, having worked with HVS for 20 years, and back in the days, 70% of our partners were females, it never seemed to me as much of an issue. Not to suggest that we didn't have to work towards ensuring there are more women in the room. I remember the first conference, 2007, at Medina Jumeirah, I was the only female. Very intimidating, I must say, and I was really looking forward to the day, like today, where the room is half full with women. So, We've seen definitely more women rising to leadership role. Uh, my team is 80% women, genuinely not by uh, favoring them, but they are qualified and they're rising to the opportunity. Perhaps in the consulting world, it's slightly different. Recognizing that the hotel industry is tough, 
I mean, I'm not discouraging anyone, but I'm, in reality, it's long working hours. You're working when everyone else is having fun. It's the worst you're doing your best and someone is drunk and doesn't appreciate your work. I mean, these are typical examples of the frustration in our industry. So what is it that we can do, A, to make it a better industry for both men and women? And I think for women, I see it rising already in KSA. You know, on the last couple of trips, I interacted with women at reception or elsewhere, which is fantastic. But I think also for companies to acknowledge that we need to make it more attractive to start with, from working hours, from our understanding, sympathizing, and also for women to actually rise up and say, I can do it, right? It's a choice. You can either say, I can do it or not. But when you say, I can do it, there are opportunities out there. Agreed. Aradna, so we heard the gentleman on the previous panel sp speaking about how difficult it is to sort of encourage the next generation of hoteliers. And with women, like Hala mentioned, there's a little bit, it's more nuanced. How do you, what, what are some of the barriers to entry that you think we can alleviate so that we can encourage more women into the space? So from where I'm sitting, I think um, now specific to uh, the region, KSA in specific, this is the golden era for tourism in the kingdom, right? I mean, if you look at the most visible projects, they're all in tourism. So the Giga projects, by virtue of existing, are not just elevating the profile of, when I say tourism, it's travel tourism and hospitality, of travel tourism and hospitality as a sector in the kingdom, but globally, and that is being looked at by aspiring young girls who want to join the sector. Now, there's very interesting news actually coming out, um, numbers coming out of um, the kingdom, which actually said they did a survey of young girls who are considering a career after graduation, and a whole lot of them thought that travel tourism and hospitality is going to give them a lot more work-life satisfaction than other sectors. Now, that is directly proportional, obviously, to the visibility of, um, uh, of, of these projects and what they're doing which then brings us back to what we need to do and what are the barriers, right? Because what we need to do is do two things. One, get more women to join the sector, and that's one, but that's not enough. We also need to elevate more women to leadership positions, and that has to happen at the same time. Now, with regards to um, the barriers, I think we as female leaders, we have responsibility. We have to step up, keep up, turn up, and speak up. Because how can you inspire others if you're not inspired? And how can you inspire others if you're not visible? So I think we all have a personal responsibility to inspire the younger generation to join the sector. Now, the final point about barriers, number one, data. I think someone mentioned, I don't know if it was Christopher who said that how can you measure something which how can you manage something Heaven which measure. you can't measure we need data now Hala says we have enough women in the sectors I need to throw data which you will understand really well and say we have 50% women in the sector but we have only 4% women who make up to the CEO slot right so we need data number two we need accountability we need independent verification we need uh, uh, regulators stepping in to actually see what is being measured is being held accountable, and people are being held accountable. Hold the CEO online, and then you will see change on the ground. And finally, number three, we can ask for the world, but it's so important for women to be given the infrastructural support they need to bring and turn up with their whole selves at work. I'm talking schooling, I'm talking childcare, I'm talking any other kind of support that we need to be able to turn up 100%, right? I think what we really need to make sure is women don't ever have to make a choice between having a fulfilling career and having a family. It should, be, it should not be mutually exclusive. You need to do both because you can do both. And if tourism has to fulfill its potential in the kingdom, in the UAE, anywhere in the world, you need women front and center and you need women visible in leadership. I don't know about you guys, but that just got me fired up. I want to go outside immediately after this. Lord Ben! <laughs> <laughs> okay, Diane, I'm going to bring this to you. I know that at Gensler, you have a lot of localization and gender equality strategies. Can you tell us a little bit about the impact of those initiatives? 
Yeah, I mean, we have a diversity, equity and inclusion uh, strategy, and I think to your point about what you, you can't measure, what uh, you, can't, you can't manage what you what can't you measure, um, we actually really very clearly focus on creating opportunities, mentoring uh, diverse teams, making sure that we actually provide equal opportunities and make sure that all of our designs are actually focused on inclusivity. And I think when you actually um, hold yourselves accountable, to your point, you actually manage your diversity, equity and inclusion within your group so that you actually lead by example. And I think when you do that, you actually set a tone and create a, a standard for other groups to follow what we are doing, which essentially is crafting strategies that you can put in place with very clear uh, goals that are very smart goals that you can measure, that you can hold people accountable, and that you can actually put in place different plans to bring everybody with you, because that's really what we're looking to do as, as businesses, um, both here, be local, um, employ locals, be part of the culture, be part of the roots, um, and contribute. You know, we are here to contribute and, and bring people with us, which I think is what we what we want to do, and that is innovation, really. Hala, you mentioned some fantastic stats, you know, from your company specifically, and how well you guys are doing at bringing women in and attracting women. If you could give other companies advice or, you know, tell your strategies on how you empower women within your organization, what would you say? Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, that would be an advice, because I think it really takes that the company believes in, in certain aspects, and I wouldn't call it necessarily inclusion. I look at it very differently. I've been given the opportunity, and therefore, I have an obligation, and this is very personal, to give someone else the opportunity. So I'm excited and I'm very proud when women do apply and they are equally capable, right? So again, I wanna stress that it's not I don't go about it, I just want to hire women. No, if they have a fair chance, I would love to give them that opportunity. The, the way I believe perhaps has allowed me to empower and encourage, and perhaps this is not a popular thought, but this is very personal to me. I've recognized over time that as much as we would like to be equal to men, is as much that we would like to be a citizen of the world, women are different to men, culturally but also different, which also adds a layer of complexity. Whichever way this will sound, when I hire, the way I train a female is very different. The way I praise it, sorry, the way I praise a female is very different. Men are satisfied with a word or two, and that's it. It's the same message. The way I would give praise to a female is talking to what a female would like to hear. So I think it takes a little bit more than just the policies that companies are doing. Even on, on, on the training itself, the way our mind operates, because I'm a believer that no matter what, we are very different, uh, men and women, and therefore this should be part of our communication. If we want to encourage them, if we want to comfort them, we just have to be a bit do much more as leaders and as companies to make them feel quite comfortable. Aradna, if you could paint a picture of what the future of hospitality looks like with Vision 2030 in mind as well as with women empowerment in mind, what would it look like? Ooh. Unbound with infinite potential, limited only by your imagination. I love that. So we have about 30 seconds left. So I'm going to start with you, Diane. What advice would you give the next generation of female hospitality members? I would say um, just do it. Embrace it. Uh, find a mentor. Work with that uh, individual and just do it. Short and simple. I love it. Hala, what about you? Any advice for the next generation of female hospitality? 
uh, I'll agree with that, just do it. And I'll add that I definitely think our industry would benefit from females coming from outside of the industry, bringing a fresh pair of eyes and insights. So I'm actually encouraging migration from the airline sector, from the retail, from the tech, just so that it helps us think differently as the hospitality industry. Aradna. Famous last words. Um, advice to the young generation of girls. Ooh, um, have a plan, but hold it loosely. Stay true to your values, but lean into change and really open up your arms because you can have it all and you ought to have it all. I love that. Well, <laughs> vision needs innovation and innovation needs people. And it's been a pleasure being on this stage with you beautiful ladies and among the people that are moving us closer and closer to Vision 2030 every single day. Thank you guys very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you.